Welcome to the Sit Down Zumach podcast. It's the Z Man coming live and direct in full effect, straight out of the annex with today's episode. Today's episode, everybody. One of my favorite episodes I've ever recorded. I'm not saying that just to get you pumped up. This might not be your cup of tea, but for me, it means so much. Episode 192. On the podcast today, crew motherfucking Jones himself, a.k.a. Bill Allen from the 1986 BMX Classic Rad. Yeah, Rad. Crew Jones is on the podcast today. Bucket list. Thank you, Ashley Thornton. If anyone knows me, any friends of mine that are listening, any fans of mine from Throughout the years, I've always referenced Rad. Rad is a part of my childhood. It is a part of my upbringing. It's a part of my DNA. The fabric of what the Z-Man is. The building blocks, if you will. The movie Rad. Let me tell you a little story about a young Z-Man. Okay? Back in the day, I moved to Kent, Ohio. I was living with my aunt and uncle out in Streetsboro. My mom came back, and we moved to Kent to a two-bedroom apartment. At the time, I looked up to my cousin Jason, Jason Zumach. He was my idol. He was a few years older than me. And Jason started getting the BMX bicycles, and he was pretty good, him and his friends. And I was like, I want to be like my cousin Jason. I want to read. I want to ride BMX bicycles. So my mom, you know what she does? She runs out and buys me a Huffy bike. A Huffy BMX. Do you know what Huffy is? I'll tell you right now. It is the bottom of the line. The bottom of the line BMX you can possibly find. The budget BMX that you get at a department store like a Kmart. It is a shit bike. And if you're a young boy, kids are impressionable. They want the new things, the cool things, the new Jordans, the new Swatch, just to date you, or myself. (laughs) And mom buys me a Huffy bike. So I get the Huffy. My cousin Jason immediately starts making fun of me. I'm like, all right. My idol is making fun of me. So we live in this new neighborhood. I see some kids practicing BMX moves. I roll up on the Huffy. Immediately, all the kids start making fun of me, pointing, laughing. (laughs) That kid's on a Huffy. He must be on welfare, food stamps. This guy sucks, whatever the case may be. And I immediately roll away. And I'm sad. I'm like, I, I can't I can't ride this Huffy anymore. I go back to my mother. And I'm like, Mom, the kids are making fun of me. Cousin Jason's making fun of me. I need a better bike. She's like, we can't afford a better bike. And I'm like, I can't ride this Huffy. They're making fun of me. She's like, who cares what they think? I do. I care what they think, okay? I'm the one on the Huffy. So I start riding the Huffy isolated by myself, practicing BMX moves. And the movie, Rad, somehow comes out, changes my life. 1986 BMX movie that I saw in the theaters. Had a short run in the theaters, immediately went to VHS. And not only did I rent the VHS, pretty sure we kept it from the video store and I wore it out. Crew Jones. Okay, Paperboy turned BMX champion was my idol. I watched that movie front to back three times, four times a day. And every time I'd watch it, I'd go out and practice my BMX moves on the Huffy. Right? Bunny hops, indos, riding on one wheelie, racing. I'd do it when no one's around. It was my training camp. Okay? It's like when Bruce Wayne... Went overseas to practice his ninja moves to become Batman. Except I was in Kent, Ohio, in the woods, around no one, practicing BMX to be the next Crew Jones. So I get pretty good on this BMX Huffy. I go back to mom. I go, mom, let me show you some tricks. I'm doing the bunny hops, the indos, riding on one wheelie. She's so impressed. She's like, we're going to go get you a new bike. I'm like, mom... I don't want another Huffy. I want a BMX Mongoose. I want a BMX Diamondback. Top of the line. Okay? It's that or nothing. 
Much to my mom's credit, she took me to Eddie's Bike Shop. We walked in, and glorious BMXs everywhere. Some of the best bikes you've ever seen. I immediately went to the Mongoose. She immediately says, way too expensive. But... There were some bikes on clearance. One was a black diamondback bike. My cousin Jason had a diamondback. I'm like, okay, if I get this diamondback, my cousin Jason will respect me. And it was black. It looked cool. And I go, Mom, I need pegs. I need pegs for the back bike so I can do tricks. She's like, I don't know if we can afford pegs. I'm like, Mom, we need pegs. She buys me pegs. I got pegs now. And there was a chain guard, and it wasn't cool to have a chain guard on your bike. People, I remember I had a chain guard on the Huffy. They called me chain guard master and laughed. I don't know if that's an insult, but at the time, it hurt my feelings. So I asked the people at Eddie's Bike Shop, take off this goddamn chain guard. My mom's like, it's to protect you. I'm like, no, you need this chain guard off, okay? You you don't understand, mom. This is serious shit. You have to trust me on this. Did you see all those moves I did for you? Did you see those moves? Okay? This is my world now lady we take the bike home i immediately ride up to where all the kids bmx'd i rolled in there on this bmx how do i describe it how do i describe it okay it's like ferris bueller pulling up in that ferrari to the school you know all eyes were on me they're like oh look at immediately immediately just because of the bike I was riding. I was accepted. And then they saw the moves I broke out, the Indo, the bunny hop, and they're like, okay, okay, we were wrong. This kid's cool. And immediately I was part of the neighborhood crew, the clique, riding every day, racing. I was one of them because of the movie Rad and Crew Jones. My cousin Jason comes over. Sees the Diamondback. He immediately becomes proud of me. And then he sees the tricks I pull out from all the practicing. The hours of practicing on the Huffy. The Huffy was my open mic. The Diamondback meant I made it. And I was a hardcore BMX rider for the next three years. And then I quit completely. I don't know why. I think I found basketball. But I was all in for three years. Non-stop riding my BMX. Non-stop watching the movie Rad. Rad, everybody. You can go online and watch Rad if you've never seen Rad. For people that don't care, and I'm sure there's a lot. This is a very niche podcast. So the people that are listening, you're all in. You're dialed in. You know what I'm talking about with Rad. Let me tell you a little bit about Rad before we get into the conversation with my man, Crew Jones, a.k.a. Bill Allen. First of all, it was an amazing BMX movie. It was made right in the heart of the BMX era. It was about a small town kid, okay? He was a small town kid. He was a paper boy, delivered USA Todays. And a major BMX race came to town. And they wanted to uh they wanted to make it a big thing for the neighborhood, I believe. You know, it was supposed to bring in revenue. And they wanted to sponsor their small time hero, Crew Jones, aka Bill Allen himself. And he went up against the sponsor's champion, Bart Taylor, played by Olympic gymnast turned actor Bart Thomas. We talk about that in the interview with Bill Allen. He explains how he came onto the film. It's pretty cool. Back in the 80s, Bart Thomas was a huge, huge gold medalist. And then he went into acting. We'll put a pin in it. But Bart's the bad guy. He is the Johnny LaRusso of bicycles, okay? And he doesn't play by the rules. So Crew Jones, is the deck stacked against him. But the phone, the film focuses on Crew. He's a young BMX racer. He lives in a small town. And his mother, played by Talia Shire. Talia Shire was Adrian in the movie Rocky. Yo, Adrian! And it turns out I found out a little something else in the Bill Allen interview about Talia Shire. You can listen for that. And Crew Jones has a sister. Now, Crew's faced with a tough decision. Qualify for Hell Track. That's the name of the big race that's coming to town. Hell Track, everybody. Or he needs to take the SAT in order to attend college. It's one or the other. Winning Hell Track, you know what that meant? It meant winning $100,000, a brand new Chevrolet Corvette, but more importantly, BMX fame. Fame, everybody. BMX fame. You know what my man Crew Jones does? 
He chooses the former option. He ignores his mother's wishes. He does what every rebel, every punk rocker, every BMX rider would do. You take on the challenge of Hellcrat, uh, Helltrack. Excuse me. Too pumped up. Now, Helltrack, it was endorsed by the city. And Duke Best, who was played by the great Jack West. Uh, was it Weston? Yeah, Weston. He was the president of the Federation of American Bicycles and the owner of Mongoose Bicycles. But the Bass wants to keep adjusting all the rules because he wants to keep crew out. He wants he knows crew's a badass. He wants to keep him out of the race to ensure that Bart Taylor has an easy road to victory. He's their he's their golden boy, the golden child, if you will, of BMX riding. Racers from all around the small town come to Hell Track, and Crew meets his love interest, Christian Hollins, who's played by Lori Laughlin, the criminal from Full House. You guys know Lori Laughlin, the felon, one of the worst criminals of all time? Lori Laughlin, before she was a piece of shit, Lori Laughlin played Christian Hollins, one of her earlier films. And Bill actually has some interesting things to say about Lori Laughlin later in the podcast. He also becomes crew. Jo- she she also becomes Crew Jones's romantic interest in the film, and actually Christian and Crew, they meet at a local high school dance, where instead of dancing, like other couples, you know what they do, they freestyle bike stunts on the dance floor, to the hit song, "Send Me an Angel."
during the dance, the evil twins and Bart say they had enough. Let's scram. And they leave the high school dance. But meanwhile, Crew Jones, a.k.a. Bill Allen, and the felon, Lori Laughlin, tear up the joint. They're the talk of the school, the talk of the town, until the next day. The very next day after their send me an angel dance that got everyone talking, Crew finds out he's being blocked from the race due to a last-minute rule change on a participant sponsor. Crew is ready to give up. He's done. He's like, I'm done with this. I am done with my dreams. I'm going to go take the SAT. I'm never going to get into hell track. I'm never going to win it. Until his younger sister, Wesley, gives him a t-shirt. And the t-shirt says, Crew is rad. I need to get one of these stat off eBay. I need a Crew is rad shirt. Then Crew and his friends come up with an idea. For him to enter the race, they're going to use the $10,000 crew won from qualifying. They start up rad racing. This genius idea is a small t-shirt business. However, days before the race, Bass changes the rules yet again, claiming the company sponsoring a racer must be worth at least $50,000. $50,000. They're doing everything in their power to keep Crew Jones out of hell track. Everything. The town's livid. People are talking. So they rally behind their hometown hero crew and his friends and their contributions along with a generous donation from wealthy local Mr. Timmer. Rad racing becomes a reality. They get enough money where Crew Jones is finally to enter Hell Track. The day of the race. Hell Track. Duke Best, this son of a bitch, gets the Reynolds twins, the evil twins, to try to take out Crew during the race. To no avail, because Crew Jones is too good. Everyone knows it. In the final lap, Evil Bart, a.k.a. BMX Johnny Lawrence, leads the race, slows down. This cocky son of a bitch slows down because he thinks he's so good, he wants to go neck and neck, face to face, one on one with Crew Jones himself in the final stretch well guess what spoiler alert if you haven't seen this 1986 classic crew ultimately wins hell track he wins the whole goddamn race after all the obstacles they put him through crew jones wins hell track and from there bart taylor the johnny lawrence of bmx is kicked off the mongoose team he's a joke he's kicked to the curb But Crew Jones, being the class act that he is in the final scene, goes up to Taylor and offers him a spot on Riot Racing. From there, the credits roll, and I'm pretty sure Crew Jones fucks Lori Laughlin. I I don't know if that was on the DVD extra, the VHS extra, but I like to think he had sex with her. I'm putting it out there right now. The movie Rad, 86 BMX classic, one of my favorite movies of all time. And talking to Crew Jones himself was a treat. I actually met Bill Allen a year ago at the Hollywood Improv. I got to meet his wife. We talked for a long time about the movie Rad and other things. You'll hear it in our conversation. I hope you enjoy it. And again, before we get to it, I want to thank all the people that have signed up on the Patreon. $3 a month. $3 gets you the episodes early, earlier, ticket giveaways, extra content. I got t-shirts coming. I also want to thank Doug Adams, who just signed up for the $20 spot. Doug just signed on a couple days ago. And I want to thank Kate and Jeff T., who actually, one PayPal'd, one Venmo'd me money. And I just want to give them a shout-out. They did this two months ago, and I feel bad that I didn't give them the shout-out until now. But I want to thank you guys so much. I want to thank our sponsors, Just Water. They're still here. Just Water, the official water of the sit down zoomock podcast you can go to justwater.com and perry skincare the ultimate skincare product at perryskincare.com as i burp that's why i podcast it's not professional broadcasting everybody so let's get this thing going you ready for my conversation with crew jones aka bill allen himself childhood idol on the lawson's chip dip hotline let's go right now Oh 
Sitting in silence, facing it alone Gotta keep my cool, make them think I'm made of stone It's a game of wills we're playing, our nerves are made of steel Balanced on the edges of everything we feel It's gonna take all we've got Just to make it through this night Gotta feel it right through my skin And it's cutting like a knife Getting ready to break the ice Feels like time is standing still Aim it right for your heart Ready to take another spill Only you can make it right You can break the ice inside of me A single-minded passion A solitary stand On the phone is somebody who has indirectly been a part of my life for the past 30 years, actor, musician, producer, and I'm going to consider my friend at this point, Bill Allen. Bill, how are you? Good to talk to you, old friend. How are you? Good, man. I I thank you for doing this, by the way. I know you have a lot of things going on in your life, but uh, I wanted to get you on the podcast for a long time. I had a bucket list full of people who have impacted me, and you were one of them. Well, that means a lot. Thanks, Chad. Happy to be here. Definitely. And uh, again, thank you so much and to your lovely li- wife for sending out that book for me. I read it from uh, top to bottom. And you've lived a pretty interesting life in Hollywood. You've been in the business for a long, long time. It's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, I have moved out to California in probably 84 and uh, immediately kind of hit the ground run and started working in TV very quickly. And, uh, yeah, got surrounded by a, a very talented group of people who I still talk to, uh, many of them who haven't passed and or passed into incredible stardom. So, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been a great ride, and people love the book, and now it's coming out nationwide this year, and it'll be on audiobooks. So that, that's cool. And actually, in the book, one of your first roles with is George Clooney. That's crazy. Yeah, my first movie was with George's uh, cousin also, Miguel, who got George into the business through that movie. Uh, We uh, were both contracted to do a movie in Lexington, and cousin George had just gotten out of business school out of Ohio. Did you say Lexington? uh, That's where I did my first movie. I'm in Lexington as we speak doing a show. That's crazy. That's crazy, dude. Crazy. <laughs> well, well, yeah, everything crazy in my life up until that point happened in Lexington. It was just a, it was kind of like apocalypse now, and just a, everything was going nuts. But we were able to be on location there in uh, Kentucky for six months or so, and um, <clears throat> that's where I got to meet George's family, and, and uh, of course, his uncle, Jose Ferrer, was in the movie, and uh, it was just a great entree into the business, and one that will never be repeated. It was just a crazy time. And from there, you do some TV work, and from what I understand, you, you get casted in Hill Street Blues, the TV show? It's true. I had a really nice guest starring role in Hill Street Blues. I was probably 21 at the time. No, a little over. And uh, so, yeah, I had a really nice teacher girl where I got to cry up a storm and, you know, kind of chew the scenery. And Hal Needham, who was casting Rad, saw that performance not once but twice when it repeated just before he was getting ready to cast Rad and brought me in. And so we ended up hitting it off real well. We're both from the South. And, you know, I just recently found out that the producers wanted uh, a particular actor, and um, that actor wanted the role also. Uh, that, actor, that actor is Robert Downey Jr., <coughs> but I think he rubbed Hal the wrong way. So uh, they went with the nice guy from the South, and I, I'm pretty glad they did. Now, when you uh, read that role, were you thinking this is just another part? You're like, eh, were you into BMXs? Was that even an interest of yours? You know, it wasn't 
at the time, uh, my main focus was acting at the time, and I didn't have a lot of extracurricular stuff going on. And so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was just kind of offered to me the, the opportunity to go in, and as I said, Hal had already seen me, and that's why I was brought in. I don't think I knew that at the time, but... Uh, the, the cards were already stacked in my favor. In other words, all I had to do was not go in and screw it up. I, I had to sit on a mongoose bike. I read maybe a couple of scenes, very easy peasy. And the next thing you know, I'm up in Calgary shooting the thing. So it was a very short time between getting the role and actually being on set. And so had I more time to prepare, I would have probably spent more time on a bicycle but they got what they got <laughs> and they had the best stunt doubles for me and probably five i think at latest count who who actually doubled for me were, were you familiar with bmx culture at the time and how popular it was not at all not at all and i don't think the world was really i mean it, it certainly had its fans and you know bmx action and all these uh magazines that kept subscriptions going but i walked in to a situation and on a set that was just mind-blowing. You know, I mean, between the riders and Hell Track and the qualifying stuff, it was uh, it was kind of BMX on steroids, and that was my introduction to the sport. So, you know, people ask me a lot, did I believe that it was going to have such an impact? And and I, I absolutely at the time believed it to just have the potential to blow up and, and certainly it did on home video not so much in the theaters i think it was under marketed or improperly marketed so uh, it did find its audience and and here it is 34 years later they're getting ready to re-release it and it'll be on blu-ray <clears throat> so there's some cool stuff happening in the rad universe i remember at the time i was very young into bmx's and i remember the promos and they were pushing Talia Shire because she was Adrian at the time. So it was Adrian's in this BMX movie. That's how I remember it. That's funny. Well, <clears throat> she produced it with her husband, and uh, she was certainly the biggest name in the show. She played my mother. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were some great, really great character actors or actors, uh, uh, Jack Weston and, and Ray Walston, uh, certainly Talia. Uh, but really, it was, as you know, a love story with me and the great uh, infamous Lori Lachlan. And so uh, they they played that card. But really, you know, I, I, I think it was <clears throat> mostly for teens, early teens and, and even younger, I, I think were the people most attracted to it. So I don't know that, that, that Talia's name had a big draw in that world. But... I, I, I don't think it was actor dependent. I think it was really just kind of a magic mix of good acting along with this BMX world that very few people have been exposed to. Well, since you, since you touched on it, will we see? Will we be seeing Bill Allen as a character with, witness in the college admission scandal with Lori Loughlin? <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Because I got some, uh, I got some stuff to say about it. I mean, forget the fact that there's a scene in Rad where she's trading t-shirt labor for test scores <laughs> cheating you know i mean there's definitely a hole in the matrix there and you know as a as a character witness for the prosecution yeah it would not go well for her, i'm afraid uh uh and you know i i, I loved her at the time <clears throat> despite the fact that you know uh there seemed to be some class differences you know, yeah, and, and why not? Why not? I was a redneck hippie from Texas. So, you know, uh, of course there'd be some class differences. You, you know, the whole movie from top to bottom. And then how does uh, a, a character like Bart Connor, who's an Olympic gold medalist, get casted in that? Well, I don't, you're probably too young to remember, <clears throat> but I was in Los Angeles during the 84 Olympics and the gymnastic team that won a half a dozen gold medals that he came from, they were rock stars. And so uh, him and another actor, Kurt, oh, his last name escapes me, it'll, it'll come to me, him and another uh, Olympian from that team both got movies out of that uh, Olympic performance. 
and the other one, the other movie was Jim Cotta. Does this ring a bell? Of course, I know Jim Cotta. That was another VHS favorite. Yeah, well, it was another teammate of his from the Olympic team, and his deal was he'd be like running down an alley, and there'd be like a parallel bar, and he'd swing on it, and then the bad guys would run into his feet. It was very believable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Bart was, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, the, the Bruce Jenner of his day pre-dress up, and he, uh, got the role because of uh, because of his performances and as, as an Olympian as an athlete and they even named the character Bart so yeah he was very lucky to, he was kind of like he was kind of like uh, crew Jones's Johnny Lawrence and they were like kind of like the BMX Cobra Kai's kind of except I, I think the difference is and <clears throat> the reason I like rad the, the kind of uh, undertones is the real bad guy in Rad was the corporation and Jack Weston and, That's and true. the mongoose that, the mongoose corporation actually Bart Connor was he, he was my uh, opponent in racing but had he not waved me on and we go mano a mano the last round in Rad I mean that that made me a hero if he had not done that. I would not have won the race. So, you know, there, there's some cool themes in that, that that take more than one viewing, I think, to figure out that it, it, it was the corporate takeover of the sport was that was the bad guys. The, the Most of the riders are in it for each other, you know. So Hell Track was pretty much, it was just a corporate, it, it was a corporate uh, monster. It was just, uh, it was all dirty. It was, and as you remember, the whole first act of the movie is is how his crew, even though he's supposedly allowed to race in this sport, actually going to qualify, and the odds were against him. The, the The corporations tried to block him out of it, and so that that was one of his first of three or four hurdles that he had to get over to to get to the final race. Uh, so it just kind of shows you that you need to just plow forward. If you believe in what you're doing, you know, you can't really be uh, uh, sidelined by corporate interests or, or what society tells you or your family, and that's who Talia represents in the screenplay, is your familial uh, obligations and your societal obligations, and he had to kind of get past that, you know, to, to do what he, he believed was right. Since 86, how many people have told you they became paper boys because of you? A lot. A <laughs> I'm, lot, I'm one of them. Uh, dude, it's amazing, right? I mean, those days are pretty well gone. But, yeah, I've met, I, I've lost count of how many Crew Joneses I've met or heard of. Uh, and and even there's a little crew uh, girl in Dallas that I know. So, you know... It's just kind of entrenched in a part of the culture, and you'll see it on TV now. I've been on Tosh.0 several times. He's a huge fan, and American Dad did a tribute to it. It's been on Fallon, and now it's finally getting re-released. So I think there's kind of been a vacuum that that is about to be filled. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Well, retro is so big right now. There's so many remakes, reboots, and I see Rad in that wheelhouse. I mean... I, I see that become. You said they're, uh, they're re-releasing it on Blu-ray and everything else. Are they? You said they're doing something else, like a Rad Twenty Twenty sort of thing. Uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Oh. <laughs> so, so we got exclusive. Uh, uh, we, we got nothing, dude. I'm just saying there's a lot of cool stuff happening in the in the Rad universe. The first is the rollout of the movie and the Blu-ray, and I believe all these things are in the offing. You mentioned Tosh.0. Okay, go ahead. Uh -huh. No, go ahead. You mentioned Tosh.0. I used to open for Daniel, and one of our bonding factors was Rad. That's how him and I, like, we were hanging out at the comedy clubs. We would talk about the movie Rad, so you actually brought Tosh and I together a long time ago. That's crazy. Well, I understand. <clears throat> Even recently, if you went to see him live, he would play the opening credits uh, before his performance for the audience, you know, so he's, yeah, he's one of those people who will just stay up at night thinking crazy stuff the last time I was on his show. He opened the show with 
crew cheated during qualifying, roll the tape, you know, and sure enough, he, he rolls the tape of me, you know, like cutting across the, the barriers, and then he starts really calling me out, and I'm the, planted in the audience, and I have a hissy and walk out of the studio. It's pretty funny, but yeah, there's people who, who sit around and think about these kind of things, you know, they'll, they'll email me, did you take those SATs, you know, are, are, you, are you still... Are you still riding the circuit? All these things, and you want to go, it wasn't a documentary, guys. <laughs> you know, I, 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 Jay Miron told me that, yeah, he's heard people say, yeah, crew's still out on the circuit riding, and you just want to go, what? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> God bless him. You know, the illusion worked a little too well. In other words, I got people... Uh, you know, real BMX riders all the time asking me, did I do my own stunts? And at that point, you're going to go, well, sure, why not? If, <laughs> if you're that gullible. You know, with all the streaming services out right now, it's it's. I would see there's a there's a market to bring Rad back, kind of like they brought back the Cobra Kai series with Karate Kid, what Crew Jones is doing now, maybe Crew Jones' kid. There could be something there. Thank you. Yeah, I think there is, and I think this is... Uh, a fan-driven kind of uh, narrative that, that that would make sense, and so yes. One of the yes. interesting things you told me it was I think it was two years ago we met. You said Shaquille O'Neal was a big fan of yours. Uh, well, I know he came up to Bart Connor at a party, and Bart was all excited, <laughs> and uh, he's like, "You know that movie Red? I'm a real big fan." You know, so. Uh, Bart has kind of resigned himself to the fact that he's much more beloved and known for Rad than he was for those gold medals, which is amazing. You know, you have, you have this body of work. You've done so much. You're a musician, and you're in the band Pipe Fitters with Lou Diamond Phillips, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. And this, like, and I talk to people all the time. I've met everybody in, as, as well as you. Does, does it bother when you have an iconic role like that and people constantly ask you about this 30 years later? Oh, man, I mean, I could goof on it all day long, but I am so lucky. I am so lucky. It's such a cool role uh, to have in people's minds and, and hearts, and it's something I forgot about for more than a decade. I took it off my resume. You know, it's just I thought it was so in the past, and it wasn't. It was gaining momentum, and, and, and you know, audiences choose what films have legs as far as what they want to see years later and this is one of those and it's it informed kids in a way that few films did in other words nobody had a millennium falcon in their backyard <laughs> but pretty much everybody had a rusty bike so they would see this movie and go well i can do that you know and some of them went on to do that and and become pros i met ryan nyquist at x games and first thing he said to me was thanks for the inspiration so it had that kind of effect on people who some became champions on their own. On the flip side of that, I actually, before I knew I was going to call you today, I went on YouTube and I watched some stuff. Actually, Crew Jones's outfit at the prom still holds up. Like, I could wear that now and look pretty retro and cool with the, uh, I don't know if really? you remember, the parachute Par pants, the Converse. Parachute pants, parachute pants with rhinestones. Dude, I, I'm dying to see you wear this. I'll wear that I on will, stage I and I'll take a photo and send it to you. I'll wear that on stage. Uh, I love it. I love it. You are the man. You could you could bring this uh, this whole look back. I'm not afraid if you're not, you know. Uh, because, yeah, the lights dim, and then they come back on, and all of a sudden I'm covered in rhinestones. Yeah. And it's like, what, what just happened? So nobody seemed to care, dude. Nobody cared about the wigs or the, you know, the just impossible uh, shots, some of them. Like, they're spinning their handlebars in the bicycle boogie scene well they didn't have that mechanism back in the day they just had to clip their brake cables you know so uh, all that stuff is part of the fun of picking it apart and and goofing on it but when i sit down uh, as i still sometimes do with an audience to watch it okay i watch it three times a day but when i do watch it it still gives me chills watching the whole qualifying race and i don't know how it works man it's just it, it's it's it somehow still holds up. Absolutely. It's it's cinema, as a, a former child BMX rider, I mean, it's one of those things you go back, you take us to a place, a simpler time, and that's the beauty of the film, 
and you just have all the memories just come rushing back of where you were wearing out the VHS tape that I stole from the video store. It all comes back. Right, right, right. So for a lot of folks, so that's that's part of my joy <clears throat> is when I meet people face to face. You can literally see them turn into their twelve year old selves. And, and and the barriers come down, and I can be myself, and they can be themselves, and it's just really, I can say, I'm friends with thousands of fans, many thousands of fans. It's just, uh, uh, they feel like they know me already, you know, and, and so I just go with that. And, and in fact, you know, it, it's a nice avatar to have out there because I believe in that guy, and and. I, and so it's just a, a really sweet thing to have. Do you get any kickback from Kick Cereal? I think that should be something. Dude, if I got one half a penny for every viewing, you know, it, it would be a different situation. But it got out there somehow through the bootlegs and all that, and, and now it's now it's going to get out there in, in Blu-ray and in theaters so we can start having live events and have screenings. <clears throat> There's already going to be a half dozen at Alamo Draft Houses. Uh, the first one is at South by Southwest next month at the Stateside Theater, but then we're taking it on a road show to Alamo Draft Houses. Are you going to do like a Q&A after? I know Paul Rubens is doing that with Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. I'm going to go to one of those. That's really cool. They're really cool. I've done a bunch with Ed and Martin, a couple of my uh, friends and stunt guys from the movie, Eddie Fiola and Martin Apareo. We've, we've uh, been to several countries, and uh, we do a lot of these, but now we'll actually be able to screen these film, the, the film legally, and it's going to be great. Um, before I let you go, I know I want people to go pick up your book. Where people can get your book at? Right now, it is exclusively at my website, my rad career.com that's my rad career.com all one word and then yeah soon it'll be out on beacon audiobooks and in stores but right now you can still get the unredacted version i've had to take some chapters or, or some paragraphs out I've, i added some new material to the second edition but yeah for legal pers- purposes I'm, I'm having to <laughs> take some stuff out so you might want to grab the first edition up <laughs> Okay, uh, I want, again, I want people to buy the book. Can you share, like, a cool behind-the-scenes stories that some of the listeners might enjoy? Well, again, it talks about my early days in Hollywood. Uh, I was dear friends not only with, uh, you know, George Clooney and, and Brad Pitt, but also uh, Brandon Lee, who was my best friend, and Lou Diamond Phillips, who I knew from my day, days in Texas as an actor. We studied together, and I was out here when he got picked on a... Um, nationwide search for La Bamba came out here filmed the movie in Southern California and then there's a photo in the book of the night of the premiere at the Palace Theater and some of my childhood heroes were there uh, John Fogarty and, and, and Willie Dixon and, and, and uh, just it was a star studded night and it was the night I got to watch my very dear friend become a star and it was just, it was the coolest thing. We're, we're still working together. He's sitting down for the Brandon Lee documentary that I'm doing right now. And uh, we still remain very close, and we, we're still bandmates and friends. And so that's the kind of stuff I put in the book is just kind of insider stories that, that had I not written them, nobody would have ever heard about. You know, I was just kind of a fly on the wall to some really cool scenes. Yeah, I forgot about the Brandon Lee situation and your your friendship, but one thing I did want to ask you, I think I heard an interview, are you a helicopter pilot? I fly powered parachutes, so it's in the light sport aircraft category. I don't know if you've seen the guys with the backpack uh, propellers and they've got a parachute. That's, that's a similar machine to what I have, except I'm in a three-wheeled cart and you're, you're driving it like a riding lawnmower, but it takes off at 30 miles an hour. You can go up to 13,000 feet and fly for three hours. So right now I'm working on a, um interview show from the back seat of the ultralight. So that'll be cool. That is pretty cool. That's, a, that's awesome. The reason why I ask, and I, and I hate to leave on this situation, but, you know, being a big NBA guy in, uh, you know, Los Angeles, California lost Kobe Bryant, 
and you know being around the area where the the helicopter crash i i didn't know if you had any insight of why that would have happened or any kind of knowledge just from flying oh yeah i mean we haven't seen the uh, report but i i was in los angeles at the time and that morning it was foggy and that's pretty much all you need to know uh in, in these situations it's more than 90 percent pilot error and his aircraft did not have a terrain sensor, which is mandatory now, I understand, on those helicopters. So I would bet my ITs right now that they shouldn't have tried to land in the fog. Okay. Period, period, period exclamation point. Yeah, it's a really sad thing, you know. Uh, but I, I guess car wrecks happen every day, and, and they don't get the kind of press. That, that air wrecks do because they're not nearly as spectacular and of course this one had a celebrity and, and families involved you know so it's just just awful but it, as a general rule the the decisions that are going to keep you safe are made on the ground before you ever turn a key so i think that was unfortunate well, that's how good of a podcaster I am. I like to start on this high note of energy, and I, I like to end it on a down note. <laughs> I get it. I get it. Well, listen, it's, it's part of the uh, drama of life, and to those who live life at, at the fullest, you've got to expect these kinds of things. Uh, so, you know, that's all. That's all. I'm going to be flying around in a riding lawnmower soon, you know, with some some, some great athlete or artist in the backseat. So you just take your chances and roll the dice. Well, you know, as a guy who's been doing stand-up for a long time and doing, you know, acting, it's always a thrill for me to meet childhood. Like, when I met you, I, like, I've met, I, I've seen Bradley Cooper, and I, I could give a shit. But when I met you, I was a kid, and you were such a good dude gave me your number and everything and I'm, I'm very grateful for that and thank you for making a little boy's dream come true oh dude i do my best thank you man we have a lot of fun we'll talk soon i'm sure definitely well can people follow you on social media yeah on instagram uh, i'm bill slim allen and then i have a fan page on uh facebook all right bill thank you so much for your time good luck with the book and the uh the the, the movie and uh we'll talk to you soon Thank you so much, Chad. I had a great time. Talk to you soon. Bill Allen, everybody. Bye -bye.